Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to come here and, and speak about a you know, subject that is very dear to my heart. <clears throat> so when Romania was taken over by the communists in 1944, they began rounding up Christians and throwing them into prison. And one young Christian who found himself caught in this backlash was George Calciu. And when, when George was imprisoned as a young man in 1948, he was sent to a prison that was part of an experiment on new torture methods designed to break down a person's sense of self, to cause them to renounce everything that made them human, to, for them to renounce that they loved their family, that they loved God, that they loved their country, and to eradicate all vestiges of humanity from the human soul. <clears throat> and the, the methods that were used to achieve this were unimaginable, wouldn't even be appropriate for me to mention. Um, suffice to say, it involved forcing the prisoners to torture, to torture their friends. And <clears throat> despite his strong faith, um, Father George, well, he wasn't, wasn't a priest at this time, um, George Cassio denied his faith just to, to stop the, the torture. And this, w w while, the, while the physical torture damaged his body, the, um, what was worse was the, the uh, spiritual pain of, of denying Christ. Um, <coughs> later, when he was transferred to a more conventional prison under pressure from the West, he was gradually brought back to health through the faith of, of priests that he encountered there. And uh, here's what he wrote about the priests he encountered in prison. The priests were better prepared than we were. They knew what suffering was. They were prepared for it. They came with consolation for our hearts. They came with forgiveness. They brought forgiveness for us, so to speak. And in this way, little by little, our hearts healed and our souls and our faith came back to us. Eventually, we were stronger than before. This experience badly hurt our hearts, but in the end, when we came back to God, we were stronger. I decided to dedicate to God the remaining years of my life and to become a priest, because when those priests came into the prison, they had comforted us, forgiven us, and confessed us." End quote. After he was released in 1964, Father George Mary married and became, he pursued the vocation of a priesthood. And this period of his life culminated in him his giving seven sermons to the youth, criticizing communism and defending the Orthodox faith of Romania. And he, he knew that taking this stand and giving these sermons, he knew that it would result in him going to prison again, but he welcomed the opportunity to be in prison and this time to stand firm, this time not to deny Christ, but to be martyred instead. He fully expected to be martyred and this time not to give in. Um, and in God's providence, he actually survived the second imprisonment, which lasted from 1979 to 1984. And by the time he was finally released um, from, pressure, from pressure from the West, he had spent a total of 21 years in prison. Uh, eventually, he settled in uh, Virginia, where he served as an OCA priest. Um, so I opened with Father George's story because this is a talk about suffering and gratitude. And Father George exemplifies both of these, showing how it's possible to maintain a posture of extreme gratitude, even in times of severe suffering. Um, <clears throat> when he, later in his life, after he found refuge in the West, he gave interviews about his time in prison. And he observed that, quote, many things happened to me there that were a manifestation of God's love to me. Um, for example, he talk, talked about being visited by a little cockroach that eased the pain of his isolation. And he, he commented, you know, God sent all kinds of beings in order that we would not be alone. I am sure that in every movement, every insect, every conflict with the guards, it was the hand of God that tried to save me, to help me, to make sure that I was on the right path. It seems hard to imagine, but he would sometimes talk about his, his longing for his days in prison, because 
in the very suffering, God touched him in a powerful way. And since he had expected to die in prison, he was able to perceive every day as a gracious gift. Um, he, and he radiated this sense of, of gratitude and joy. He commented, I think that these days, these years, are given to me by God as a gift, and I pay nothing for this gift. I pay no interest on these years of living. Um, Frederica Matthews Green, who, who knew him, shared that, quote, his most distinctive feature was his smile. He had a beaming smile. He was amused by life and ready to laugh. So the, the experience, the hardship beyond anything that we can imagine, instead of leading him into bitterness and despair, seemed, seemed to instill in him a profound sense of gratitude, far greater than, than a lot of people who have never even been, uh, never been through anything like the pain that he suffered. Um, another figure that also demonstrates the same tenacious sense of joy and gratitude um, in the midst of suffering is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, I've written about his life in my book, Saints and Scoundrels, about his time as a Lutheran minister and his involvement in the plot to assassinate Hitler and, and his imprisonment because of, of his involvement in the, in the plot. And as I was researching his life for my book, one of the things that struck me was his exuberant gratitude and joy. No matter what was going on um, externally in his life, he, he continued to radiate this sense of constant gratitude. Facing the daily possibility of death um, following his imprisonment, he too um, began to view each day as a precious gift to the Lord to be received with thanksgiving and joy. I think we honor God more, he once wrote, if we gratefully accept the life that he gives us with all its blessings, loving it, drinking it to the full. In his autobiography published after his death, he had written that <coughs> gratitude changes the pangs of memory into grateful joy. It's doubtful that gratitude came easy for him, especially in the days leading up to his execution. He had much to be worried about, the, the uncertainty of, of what was going to happen and his fiancée, Maria, not knowing whether she was safe. These things weighed on him. But dis, despite this um, suffering, he remained exuberantly grateful to God and a, a gratitude that was contagious to the other prisoners. One English officer who was in prison with Bonhoeffer later uh, commented, uh, Bonhoeffer always seemed to me to spread an atmosphere of happiness and joy over the least incident and profound gratitude for the mere fact that he was alive. <clears throat> it wasn't just that Bonhoeffer was grateful to God in the midst of his suffering or despite his suffering. His letters from prison so that he was grateful to God for the very suffering itself. This is because he maintained that difficult circumstances, no less than pleasant ones, come from the hand of God and can therefore be greeted with gratitude and joy. <coughs> the, the third and final snapshot I want to share with you um, is Viktor Frankl. We've, we've, um, we've already heard about him and many of you may be familiar with his book, Man's Search for Meaning. So he was imprisoned by the Nazis because of his Jewish pedigree. Uh, he was an Austrian psychiatrist. Um, and he was imprisoned in 1944. And through his, experience in, uh, his experiences in Auschwitz and the other death camps, he witnessed the very worst of the Nazi regime. And after, after being released, he wrote about these experiences. Um, his book, Man's Search for Meaning, is an inside look at the brutality and inhumanity of the death camps such as Auschwitz and the other camps he was transferred to. But it shows that even in the midst of so much darkness, it's possible to reframe one's suffering in positive terms. For example, he tells how the suffering enabled him and the other prisoners to appreciate what was truly important in life, and thus to be grateful for little things that might otherwise be overlooked. Um, so the, the conditions of extreme deprivation enabled him and the other prisoners 
um, to be grateful for, for, for to, well, to turn little things like, like a, a sunset or the memories of loved ones, to turn these into occasions for profound gratitude. But not all the prisoners could do this. Many prisoners lost hope and gave up on life. But for those who clung to their spiritual integrity, it was, it was possible to realize high levels of purpose, even in the midst of so much suffering. Um, and he found that the, uh, the ability to find a higher meaning in and through the agony could actually make a difference to whether a prisoner um, shriveled up and died or whether they survived and continued to live. Um, in fact, that was more predictive of whether a prisoner would survive than the physical condition of the prisoner coming into the camp. And for some, finding a higher meaning in all the darkness came in the choice to accept their sufferings instead of escaping into condition of numbness and passivity. And for others, spiritual freedom came in the refusal to give up hope even when um, the chances of surviving the war seemed very slim. And for others, spiritual integrity was realized in sacrificing the little that they had for others. In one moving passage, he tells about uh, prisoners who, even though they were starving to death, they chose to, gave their, they chose to give their last bits of precious bread to feed others. And in so doing, they were able to add a deeper layer of meaning to what would otherwise be a hopeless situation. Here's what he wrote about that. We who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, the freedom to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. In the final analysis, it becomes clear that the sort of person the prisoner became was the result of an inner decision and not the result of camp influences alone. Fundamentally, therefore, any man can, even under such circumstances, decide what shall become of him mentally and spiritually. The way they bore their sufferings was a genuine inner achievement. Um, it is this spiritual freedom which cannot be taken away which makes life meaningful and purposeful." End quote. Frankel was able to later use these insights in his work as a uh, psychotherapist. He taught his patients that each of us have the power to bring meaning and purpose to our lives by how we interpret the circumstances confronting us. Now, I'm, I'm assuming that none of us here have had to endure these types of experiences that uh, these and other prisoners went through. Um, although there are Christians in different parts of the world today who suffer comparative trials. But most of us living in the contemporary West um, experience um, lives that are comparatively comfortable. But our comforts do not seem to make us more grateful. In fact, researchers have found that grumbling and complaining have reached epidemic proportions in, in our comfortable culture. And to highlight this, I'd like to share just a few statistics from the research about complaining. And I've, I've, put, um, I've, I've put references to, to these statistics in your handout. Um, so <coughs> researchers have suggested that during an average conversation, we complain to each other about once a minute and from a, <laughs> I know, from a health perspective, <laughs> this should be concerning to us from a health perspective. So when we complain, stress hormones are released in the brain that harm healthy neural connections. This also occurs when we aren't actually complaining ourselves, but when, when we are listening to someone complain. Some Stanford studies show that being exposed to 30 minutes of complaining each day physically damages the brain by peeling back neurons from the hippocampus, um, the part of the brain used for um, the higher cognitive functions and problem solving. And over time, this can actually lead to um, uh, the hippocampus um, shrinking, resulting in a decline in memory and adaptability. Now, I'm not here to suggest that a person should never complain. Um, complaining can sometimes be therapeutic um, as a way of processing our emotions, especially when we're dealing with uh, feelings like grief and betrayal and shame and heart, heartache. 
But I think we could all agree that most of the day-to-day -day complaining we do does not serve any therapeutic function, but actually makes us feel worse. One of the reasons we complain so much was suggested by economist Greg Easterbrook, uh, Easterbrook in the early 2000s. He observed that as our lives become more comfortable, we experience more things um, to be disappointed and frustrated over. Moreover, when progress occurs on a culture-wide level, not only do our expectations go up, but the baseline for normality rises um, to such... <coughs> sorry. Um, the baseline normality rises to such an extent that it's easy to begin overlooking just how blessed we are for commonplace realities. The normal things in life that ought to be occasions for profound gratitude are often overlooked precisely because they are so normal. Let's uh, just consider some of the ordinary things we can be grateful for that we often don't even think to be grateful for, but that remain occasions for profound gratitude even when everything else is going wrong. I'll just r r run through these quickly and the list could be multiplied almost endlessly. Clean drinking water, the absence of enemies on the border of our town, accessibility of books, music, and tools, freedom of worship, a warm place to sleep at night, comfortable transportation, love from family members or colleagues, medical care, access to sacraments, consistent electricity, not having to go hungry every day, salvation itself. We often overlook these types of ordinary blessings because we only see the small picture of what is less than perfect in our lives, losing sight of the big picture of how blessed we actually are. And during their times in the death camps, men like Frankel and Bonhoeffer and Father George, they were able to use circumstances of deprivation and suffering to bring into relief the grounds for gratitude provided by ordinary things that might otherwise be overlooked or taken for granted. As uh, Frankl observed when reflecting on his time, we were grateful for the smallest of mercies. And you find this idea throughout the 20th century prison literature. Um, but the, the idea predates the prison literature of the 20th century and can be found throughout the writings of saints. Consider this notable passage from the 12th century St. Peter of Damascus um, about being grateful for ordinary things. He writes, If you see light, you should remember him who gave it to you. If you see the heavens, the earth, and sea, and all that is in them, you should marvel and praise God who called them all into being. If you are clothing yourself, remember the blessings of your Creator and praise him who for, praise him for being concerned about your well-being. In short, every action of every day should cause you to remember and praise God. And if you do this, then you will be praying ceaselessly and your soul will always be joyful. End quote. This type of constant um, gratefulness is not only good for us spiritually, it's also good for us physically. In fact, um, scientists who have studied gratitude have have found that constant appreciation for the blessings we've received is particularly good for the heart. When we feel a sense of appreciation to God and others, the rhythm of the heart goes into a state of coherence, or what's referred to as heart rate variability. And this is not a state of relaxation, but the state of well-being that we often feel when we are in the presence of someone who radiates peace and stillness and warmth. Having a coherent heart rate initiates um, positive energy throughout the mind and body, resulting in increased mental, emotional, and physical fitness. And by contrast, during times when we're, during times of ingratitude um, or, or stress and frustration, um, especially the type of stress triggered by unthankfulness, the rhythm of the heart has been found to go into a state that cardiologists call incoherence. And this means that the pattern of signals traveling from the heart to the brain is dis disordered, leading to a decrease in higher cognitive functions, um, including memory, emotional intelligence, adaptability, and problem-solving skills. And in, in the modern world, 
most of us exist in a state of incoherence without even realizing it. And in order to move from a state of incoherence to heart rate variability, <coughs> uh, scientists recommend the practice of gratitude. They tell us, um, they tell us in fact, to focus on our heart area, to breathe in and out deeply, and to focus on something we, we appreciate. And they've actually measured that this is good for the heart and can bring a person's heart rate into a state of coherence or heart rate variability. And you can also incorporate meditative techniques into this, like the Jesus Prayer. You breathe in, um, as you say, the first part of the Jesus Prayer, and then breathe out slowly as you say the latter part. And a lot of the, the research on this is quite new, but every year there are more and more studies, and I put some references to these in your handout. And this is something that, that people have always experienced, but only recently have we had the equipment for measuring this on the, um, on the biological level. And this is, this is something that I've experienced firsthand after the, um, the authors, Father John and Sherry Kalbaum, um, introduced me to, to a biofeedback device um, called the M-Wave, where I can measure my, my heart rate. I'd be happy to show, show this to you afterwards. But what's, what's interesting is that um, as, I've, um, as I've taken biofeedback readings on myself and others, um, I found that we can bring ourselves into a, having a healthy heart rate when the only changing variable is what we're thinking, thinking grateful thoughts. Um, <coughs> uh, initiates um, uh, a, a state of heart rate variability more effective than any other technique. Uh, one of the, <coughs> one of the uh, companies I do consultation work for is a company that trains psychology students to pass their, their licensure exam, the EPPP. And we, we recommend um, the practice of gratitude um, simply to help the memory and to help the cognitive functions work, the, um, <coughs> preparing for the, the um, licensure exam in psychology is very mentally demanding. It's very stressful, even for people who have a PhD in psychology. And just from, just from a, uh, um, a perspective of, of cognitive enhancement, um, we, we recommend the practice of gratitude because of all the research on how gratitude helps the brain, helps, um, helps the body, and <coughs> helps with, with higher cognitive functions, including memory. Okay, so a lot of people ask, what if I just don't feel grateful? Um, after all, there isn't a switch I can just switch on to begin feeling thankful. <laughs> um, I, just, I just don't feel grateful. Um, and in addressing these questions, the contemporary research on the psychology of gratitude is very useful. And much of this research was published in 2004 by Oxford, Univer Oxford University Press in their book, The Psychology of Gratitude. They brought together scholars who work in gratitude from uh, diverse disciplines, um, biology, anthropology, spirituality, um, psychology, and so forth. And as I read through the various contribu contributions to this volume, I, I tried to see if there was a kind of common thread that could be traced through these varying perspectives. And one, one thing that became very clear as I reviewed the gratitude research from scholars working in all different disciplines was that gratitude involves the whole person, the will, the mind, and the feelings. Now that might seem like an obvious point, but understanding the threefold nature of gratitude is key to answering this, this question of how a person can go about cultivating gratitude even if they don't have it um, to begin with, especially if it's not part of their feelings. Now, we know from research done in the context of cognitive behavioral therapy that there is a web of reciprocities linking how we think, how we behave, and how we feel. 
and this is represented by the CBT triangle overhead. And for the sake of those who are listening to this on Ancient Faith Radio and can't see the visuals, I'm showing a picture of a triangle with three points occupied by thoughts, emotions, and behavior. And there are arrows running in all directions. And the arrows indicate that what we think affects how we act and feel. How we feel affects what we think and do. And what we do affects how we think and feel. Understanding this web of interconnections between thinking, feeling, and behavior it enables us to address a popular misunderstanding about emotions in our culture. So we tend to make a false dichotomy between emotions and skills. We assume that feelings occur outside of volitional control and thus we overlook the important way that feelings can be, positive feelings can be habituated and negative feelings can be censored. And what has always been emphasized within Orthodox spirituality and now within the context of cognitive behavioral therapy is that one effective way to transform a person's emotional life is for them to first bring their thinking and behavior into alignment with what is true and right. So our emotional states do not just arise in a vacuum but are continually being fashioned by our thoughts and, and behavior. Now. <clears throat> Let's apply this to gratitude. Going back to the question I posed earlier, how can a person go about cultivating gratitude if they just don't feel thankful? Now, we don't have a, a switch that we can suddenly turn on to start feeling grateful. I've had times in my life where I knew objectively I need to be grateful, but it's just not happening. I just don't feel it. Um, so although we can't control our feelings, what we can do is bring our thinking and behavior into alignment with the truth. And in doing so, we create the conditions in which emotions of gratitude can, can follow. So focusing on the mind might include things like mentally recognizing what is good in our life and acknowledging that the source of goodness lies outside of ourselves. Um, to orient the mind towards gratitude is to recognize the debt that we stand in to others and ultimately to God for the good things that we have but don't deserve. Exercising the mind towards gratitude could also involve things like mentally rehearsing everything we have to be grateful for, engaging in cognitive reframing techniques, which we'll talk about in a minute, using vigilance to watch the mind and weed out disordered thoughts and so forth. Exercising the behavior towards gratitude could involve things like keeping a gratitude journal, committing to go 21 days without complaining, mm -hmm. choosing to... <laughs> Dude, try that, it's very hard. <laughs> In fact, they, they have, um, there's this movement now where people will try to go 21 days without complaining and every time they complain, they have to go back to day one. And you'd be surprised, it, t it takes about three, three years. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the exercising the, be the behavior towards gratitude could also, could also involve things like consciously choosing to thank God for some of these ordinary things that we talked about earlier that we don't normally think to be thankful for. And through these sorts of practices, th through the choices we make, with our mind and our behavior, we um, create the conditions in which gratitude can then spill into the emotions. Now, um, notice that I, I've linked feelings with the heart, and um, this is because when we feel grateful emotionally, that's when our heart goes into a state of, of coherence or heart rate variability that I spoke about earlier. And you, but Usually this is not the starting point, but the ending point. When we work to bring our thinking and behavior into alignment with gratitude, um, <coughs> the feelings will follow. Um, one, I, one way I explain this is to think about a ship. The ship, if you lift up the anchor and put the sails out, then when the wind comes, the ship can be, begin to move forward. And orienting the mind towards gratitude is like lifting up the anchor. Bringing our behavior into alignment with gratitude is like putting up the sails. And when you do that, eventually the emotions begin to move and gratitude reaches the level of the heart.
So insofar as gratitude occurs as a result of rightly ordered behavior and thinking, it's appropriate to talk about gratitude as a skill, as something that is developed with practice. And the development of this skill is not dependent on the circumstances happening around us. Anyone can grow in the skill of gratitude no matter how messed up their life is. Um, as, I, I'm, as we saw with the prison testimonies that I opened with. And one of the things that scientists are discovering is that as we grow more skillful in the practice of gratitude, we actually affect material changes in the neural circuitry of our brains, um, leading to a happier and healthier life. Um, scientists who have studied the neuroplasticity of the brain have shown that when we, when we practice gratitude, we actually create new neural pathways in our brain. And the, the more we do it, the more the, more, uh, the stronger these pathways become. Instead of reinforcing deep ruts of complaining, uh, oh, this is wrong about today, or who can I blame for this? The default comes to be a posture of, of gratitude. What do I have to be thankful for? What's good about today? Um, what can I be, what, what are the blessings I can find even in these difficult circumstances? And this type of habituation is possible because of the flexibility of the brain, um, <coughs> known as neuroplasticity. And if you want a very accessible book about neuroplasticity, I highly recommend Norman Deutsch's book, The Brain That Changes Itself. Um, many of you may already be familiar with this, but he goes into the science of what actually happens in the brain when we habituate new behaviors including behaviors that go against long-established ruts. And for a distinctly Eastern Orthodox perspective on neuroplasticity, I highly recommend the popular book, uh, Our Thoughts Determine Our Lives, from the writings of, of Elder Thaddeus. Elder, Elder Thaddeus was such an optimist, he was, he was always radiating joy and peace and gratitude to everyone around him. But what's interesting in this book, he explains that he wasn't always like that. He used to be very negative and to suffer from anxiety. But uh, bit by bit, through, through the struggle to take every thought captive to Christ, he trained his brain to be grateful, to be at peace with the world until uh, people began coming from all over the world just to be in the presence of someone who radiated so much gratitude and joy. So talk, talk about the power of neuroplasticity, and this book is all about that. It's all about the flexibility of the brain, um, although he doesn't um, use the perspective, uh, he doesn't use the terminology of neuroplasticity, but, but the book is, is all about that nonetheless. Okay, well, I want to talk a, um, a bit about uh, cognitive reframing, um, <clears throat> which, is, which is what Elder Thaddeus practiced and what enabled him to, to have so much gratitude and joy about, about everything in life. And when we, when, when we all get to find the right overhead, when we think about framing something, you know, we think, we think about the, the frame around the picture. <laughs> Excuse me, I, I have friends who are professional artists and it's always interesting to me that um, a painting that, that is, is always incomplete until it's framed. It, a frame enables the painting to have a meaning, if you will, a, a context. Um, a, a, the work of art, it, there's something ambiguous about it before it's put in, in a frame. Um, similarly, um, we frame the circumstances of our lives by the meanings we ascribe to those circumstances. So research shows that most of what we experience in life is fundamentally ambiguous, but we, we disambiguate our experiences by how we assign meaning to them. And most of the time we do this unconsciously without even thinking about it. Uh, but these meanings the meanings we attach to what we experience provides a context in which the circumstances of our life come to be interpreted and understood. 
as the elder Paisios put it, everyone interprets events in a way that is consistent with his own thoughts. Everything can be viewed from its good or its bad side. Psychologists who have studied this have found that some common negative frames that human beings routinely use when interpreting their lives. These include things like, like splitting, where we divide everything into extreme black and white, or catastrophizing, when we exaggerate and over-dramatize our struggles, or filtering, where we focus on the negative while overlooking the positive, or mind-reading, where we think we know what another person is thinking about us, or going uh, over and over useless what-if scenarios in our minds. And these, these cognitive distortions um, act as negative frames um, to view the experiences of our lives, leading to unnecessary misery. Often, what we think are just our raw emotions actually arise um, in the wake of these disordered patterns of thought. Saint Theodore the Studite uh, talked about this principle in his um, catechetical discourses. He wrote, we feel radiant when we think about something good, and then we become dark and gloomy when we entertain somber thoughts. The change is volitional and within our power. So each of us have the power to view the raw material of our experiences in a context that can make things worse, that makes us suffer even more um, because of the negative interpretations that we uh, impose on reality. Or we can frame our experiences in positive contexts. Um, the, the stories of Father George and Viktor Frankl and Dietrich Bonhoeffer show just how powerful these positive frames can be, even in the midst of extreme suffering. Um, and their, their examples show that cognitive reframing is not choosing to ignore the bad that is happening around us, but choosing to focus on the good and to think about the positive context um, in which um, unpleasant circumstances can be situated. And Bonhoeffer did this by reminding himself that his sufferings came from the hand of God. And this came out in a letter he wrote to his brother-in-law. He wrote, we have been able to enjoy so much, so many good things together that it would be almost presumptuous were we not also ready to accept hardship quietly, bravely, and also really gratefully. Similarly, Father George uh, knew that although he didn't understand what was happening to him, and although he couldn't explain it, somehow it was part of God's plan. And cognitive reframing can be something just as simple as that, as simple as just reminding ourselves that God is still in control, even if we don't understand what's happening, and that somehow everything is part of his sovereign plan, even though we don't understand this and it's confusing. St. Theo von der Recluse wrote about cognitive reframing um, in, in, the, in his writings that were co collected into the book The Spiritual Life. There's a whole chapter about turning the burdens of life into profit. And he refers to the work of a, a bishop who took 176 situations and um, sh reframed them with a spiritual interpretation. And the idea is to get so good at this that you can just... Um, automatically frame something in spiritual terms. It becomes a kind of challenge. Okay, how can I find something good in this? How can I find something in this situation to be, to be grateful for? St. John Chrysostom wrote about cognitive reframing um, in, um, throughout his work, and especially in, in a sermon called A Treatise to Prove That No One Can Harm the Man Who Does Not Harm Himself. He goes through all the bad things that can possibly happen to a person, and systematically shows how these bad things can be reframed in positive terms. I was first introduced to the idea of cognitive reframing in this spiritual classic, The Way of a Pilgrim. Oh, I introduced this book by telling you a little story that happened to me. I, I was at a crowd in a basketball game, and I've always been more interested in conversation than sports, so I struck up a conversation with um, the gentleman next to me, and he knew I was Orthodox, and uh, so he, he started talking about this book, and he shared how um, his wife's psychiatrist, who wasn't Orthodox uh, himself, um, my friend wasn't Orthodox either, but 
shared how his wife's psychiatrist prescribed this book to people instead of medication simply because the techniques worked so well. <laughs> now, just from a medical point of view, um, it, it worked. So, so what, what were these techniques that, that worked better than taking medication? Well, one of them, of course, is, is the Jesus prayer that, that we associate with, with this book. But we often forget that the, the reason that the Jesus prayer was so effective for the pilgrim in the story is because he practiced it within the context of total thanksgiving to God. Um, <clears throat> throughout the travel narrative, we read how the pilgrim encountered one difficult situation after another, and each time he found ways to reframe what was happening in positive terms. So something bad will happen to him, he'll be robbed, he'll experience frostbite, he'll be falsely accused, and he'll get depressed about it. But then the Lord will bring something into his life that will assist him to engage in gratitude-based reframing. In my own case, God brought this book to me just when I needed to learn about this. I, I had been doing some work in England, and I suddenly found myself uh, facing a number of different disasters on various fronts. And in this low state, I, I took a, a pilgrimage to the monastery of St. John the Baptist in Essex. Here's a, a picture of a walk near the monastery. And during my eight days at the monastery, circumstances kept, kept happening that impressed upon me the importance of, of total gratitude. And I've published an account of my time at the monastery in, um, on my, my website. You can find um, the reference to it in, in the handout. But anyway, one of the critical mass of factors that um, impressed <clears throat> these lessons upon me about reframing and, and, and gratitude was, was this book, which I found, found in the monastery library, and I had never bothered to read it before. And what impressed me about this book was that if anybody had grounds for grumbling or for descending into self-pity, it, it was the pilgrim in the story. He recounts how he and his wife lost their livelihood after his wicked brother burned their inn to the ground. And as they watched all of their belongings going up in flames, they looked at each other and said, Glory be to God, at least the Bible is saved, and we have that to comfort us in our sorrow. If I was facing a disaster like that, I'm not sure that I would get, gain consolation from the fact that I still had access to the, the scriptures, because we, we just take that for granted. But for him, he was able to use this one blessing to completely reframe how he and his wife viewed the disaster. Later, his, his wife um, died and the pilgrim took to the road. And during his travels, as I mentioned before, he became the victim of various misfortunes. But he would write things like, I resigned myself to the will of God, and once again, I was happy and at peace. And the, the thing that is so helpful about this story is that this type of cognitive reframing did not come natural to the pilgrim. He was an emotional man, and he was prone to anxiety. But by using the Jesus prayer, he was able to um, cultivate a constant sense of gratitude uh, that actually led to um, extraordinary resilience in the face of hardships. And eventually he got so good at this that he could, he could summon up a state of gratitude simply by contemplating creation, um, plants, animals, the world itself, he began to see all of these things as a gracious gift. How much time do I have? Do you want to have the, the time? We've got 15 minutes. Okay, good. Well, I, I'll, I'll tell, you, tell you about one more, more text, and, and then I'll wrap up, and we'll have a few minutes for questions. So when I was new to the Orthodox faith, I took a friend of mine who wanted to learn about Orthodoxy to a little hut in our village where an Athenite monk was living um, Hiram Monk Dimitri, and he had been sent. He had been sent to our area to minister to the Russian-speaking population in Spokane. Um, and my my friend um, and I wanted to learn about the spiritual life, so we were new to Orthodoxy. We we, we went and began began asking questions. And Father Dimitri said, "There's a there's a book for beginners in the spiritual <laughs> life that you need to read." It was like. Great, a book for beginners, this should be easy. And um, 
the, uh, the book he told us about was uh, Dor Dorotheus of Gaza, his discourses and, and sayings. And this, I don't know about book for beginners, this book is so deep that you could spend, spend the rest of your life uh, just on this book and barely scratch the surface. But what's, what was interesting to me is he gives step-by-step -step guidance on how to reframe sufferings. And he just has some really remarkable things to say about how all things, even suffering and hardship, are given to us by God's providence and there can, therefore can be received with joy. We must be convinced, he writes, that all God does, he does for our benefit. And we ought to receive it with gratitude as coming from a beneficent and loving master. And this even if some things are distressing. One of the most vivid sections of the book is where he compares our trials to a wave. If someone is um, a swimmer, is jumping in the ocean, um, he imagines a, a wave, a huge wave approaching the swimmer, and the, the, the swimmer can either um, brace himself against the wave and be smashed by it, hurled a great distance, or he can, he can duck under the wave, lowering himself under it, and by embracing the wave um, and calmly waiting for it to pass, no harm will come to him. And then he says it's the same way with trials and temptations. Here's why he writes. Um, those who go on doing their work this way, like man ducking under the wave, when they are in trouble, putting up with their temptations with patience and humility, come through unharmed. But if they get distressed and downcast, seeking the reasons for everything, tormenting themselves and being annoyed with themselves instead of helping themselves, they do themselves harm. Okay, I'd like to wrap up by talking a little bit about what cognitive reframing and gratitude is not. And this is important because some people who have read my articles on this subject have come away with the impression that I'm just advocating positive psychology with an orthodox twist. And when we talk about cognitive reframing and gratitude, this is not a kind of Pollyanna, everything is happy optimism. There, uh, sometimes in the self-help literature, people are encouraged to simply assert that they are happy even when they're not. And there are some interesting studies, again, I put these in your handout, there are some studies that show that for certain sorts of people, this type of false optimism not only doesn't work, but makes them feel worse as a result. So, true gratitude is the opposite of this, since it involves acknowledging and accepting our sufferings, but then interpreting those sufferings in a spiritual way. And we can, we can get so focused on not complaining, and there's a place for that, as I mentioned earlier, but there, there's also a legitimate place for acknowledging what is wrong, especially when we're confronted with evil. To accept our sufferings and to frame them in a spiritual way presuppose, presupposes that we first acknowledge that things are not what they ought to be. And for a lot of people, this can be a very, this is a very important first step because it, it, it's easy, especially in our culture, to have a picture-perfect idea about our lives and to project that out to the world. And sometimes, before we can get to the point of reframing, we have to just admit, admit that things are a mess. When Viktor Frankl told about the inhuman conditions in Auschwitz, he accurately identified the depths of evil to which man had stooped. Yet he was also able to put an accurate valuation on what was good, and thus to underscore that what is good is stronger than what is evil. And what we have to be grateful for is more lasting than what we have to grumble about. So true gratitude is not merely compatible with an acknowledgement of pain, it presupposes it. To be grateful is to acknowledge that life is difficult while framing that difficulty within the overall context of thanksgiving. The psychologist Scott Peck pointed out that sometimes this very act of accepting that life is difficult has the potential to ease our burdens, for it enables us to rise above circumstances that might otherwise overwhelm us. I'd like to share um, a 
passage from his famous book, The Road That's Traveled. Life is difficult, he writes. This is a great truth, one of the greatest truths. It is a great truth because once we truly see this truth, we transcend it. Because once it is accepted, the fact that life is difficult no longer matters. Most of us do not fully see this truth that life is difficult. Instead, they moan more or less incessantly, noisy, noisily or subtly about the enormity of their problems, their burdens, and their difficulties, as if life were generally easy, as if life should be easy. They voice their belief noisily or subtly that their difficulties represent a unique kind of affliction that should not be, and that has somehow been especially visited upon them. Now here's how this relates to gratitude. Only when we accept that life is difficult, only when we come to terms with the fact that we have no right to be comfortable, happy, or prosperous, only then can we be truly grateful because then we can, we can see any amount of comfort and hap happiness, even small comfort and happiness, as pure gift. Uh, when we accept that life is difficult and suffering is normal, the, the little things that we might otherwise take for granted become occasions of gratitude, like the prisoners in Auschwitz when they saw a sunset, or like Father George when he was visited by a cockroach in his cell, or like the pilgrim um, <coughs> who was immensely grateful simply from contemplating the creation itself. Ultimately, gratitude enables us to be thankful even for those who wrong us, and this is a theme throughout the um, writings of the, the um, patristics, particularly the, the Desert Fathers, where you see them looking upon their enemies um, almost like, like angels. Their attitude is, wow, uh, I get to be the victim of, of wrongdoing. Uh, this is an opportunity to grow in, in forgiveness and patience and humility. Um, in the Desert Literature, in fact, again and again, we, we see them looking upon enemies almost like stepping stones to, to the Kingdom of Heaven. In the sayings of the Desert Fathers, there's a story about a monk whose, whose um, cell was right next to that of a great elder. And the monk would regularly come and steal um, everything that the elder had. And this was a great hardship to the elder because he had to forage for his own food in the desert. And it was hard enough to feed himself, um, let alone when everything was constantly stolen from him. And um, but he was gracious towards the bad monk and said, doubtless, this brother is in need. He never rebuked him. And later, when the elder was in his bed dying, um, he, he, um, the, bro the brothers gathered around him and he called for this monk who had stolen from him all his life. He said, come near to me. Then he kissed the monk's hands and he said to all of the brothers there, I am grateful to these hands, brothers, for it is through them that I am, on, I am on my way to the kingdom of heaven. The elder was grateful for the opportunity to forgive, and the thief was so pricked in his conscience that he repented. He stopped being a thief and grew to become a tried and tested monk himself. May we all have that attitude towards those who wrong us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I think we all could take something away from that today. It's fabulous. We have a few minutes for a question or two if there are any, any in the audience. Uh, yes. Speak up, please, because our... How do you uh, prevent yourself from intellectualizing? I know when I try to reframe, you start to be grateful, and then immediately you have to find a good reason for it. And, of course, the trickiest parts are when there's no good reason that we can ponder. Um, how do you keep yourself from derailing into intellectualizing? Uh, well, <laughs> that's, that's interesting because that's actually a problem that I have. Um, the, um, you can get to the point where, where you're constantly um, anal analyzing what's happening to you to, uh, uh, to, to reframe in an over-intellectual way. And I just... I just try to keep it very simple. Um, I try to, uh, um, I can only say what works for me. I'm defaulting into the, into the Jesus prayer um, and, and just trying to, trying to keep, keep the reframing 
um, on a simple level as possible. Um, every, everybody will respond, respond differently based on, on, on their own orientation and pr particularly um, people who, who are intellectual anyway um, fall into this, this <coughs> trap and I, don't, I can't say that I have a good answer for that because I also fall into that same um, uh, pitfall. Um, sometimes <coughs> there's a place for, for reframing, for analyzing what's happening and putting it in the context of Thanksgiving, um, spending quite a lot of mental effort to try to find the blessings that are there in difficult s situations. But sometimes the best way that you can take every thought captive is simply um, to ignore the monologue of, of thoughts that constantly bombard you, especially when they're tinctured with, with negativity. Um, <clears throat> one, one example is that if there are monsters in the room, there are three ways you can respond. You can fight against the monsters, um, in which case you may get clobbered. You can feed the monsters, in which case they will stay there and become stronger. Or you can do your best to ignore them and get on with, with your life. And sometimes toxic thoughts um, are like that, where the best thing that we can do is not actually to engage with them, not actually to fight them intellectually, but to simply ignore them and reckon, that, yeah, those things are there. Um, I'm struggling with that, but I'm, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to fight against that. I'm not going to feed it. I'm going to get on with our life. And um, so although, yes, there is a place for um, using our intellect to combat the cognitive distortions that arise in our mind, um, there's also a place for um, purposely ignoring ignoring them, using mindfulness techniques to watch your brain and as you, <coughs> um, as you observe your brain to use that to, to ignore um, uh, negative cognitions. I, I, know I'm, I wandered far afield from your, your, your question, but I hope that's helpful. Um, right. Yes. First and foremost, thank you uh, for presenting this. I have an abstract idea, and I'm hoping you can help me help articulate what I'm trying to ask. Uh -huh. As a priest, I live and breathe the liturgical tradition and life of, of our church. I put a lot of emphasis in my personal life to make sure that the liturgical life of my parish is as healthy as possible. And I'm wondering if there's anything from a mystagogical point of view from our liturgical services that would provide some kind of a conduit to the topic of your discussion, teaching us, giving us the tools to express gratitude when there's not, a, in our mind, there's not a whole heck of a lot to be grateful for. Trying to bring our life of liturgics, mystagogy, confronting what you're trying to teach us. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you for that thought. I think there is a lot, and one of the you could do a whole study on that. One of the things that struck me when I came into the Orthodox Church was how saturated the liturgy was in the Psalms. And most of the Psalms begin, begin with uh, laments about how terrible life is and everything, all the suffering that the psalmist is having to go through and then moves from there to reframe it in, in, in positive terms um, through, through focusing on, on God and, and his works. And we find that not only in the Psalms and the liturgy, but many of the, the other prayers. Um, and it would, be, it would be fun to dialogue about this, this further and to, to develop that. Yes. I also want to just express appreciation for how rich and well organized this was. 
uh, and I thank you. And uh, I do want to ask you if you would say a word about your book, Saints and Scoundrels, and what caused you to write it. Just a little sort of synopsis of it, and um, what caused you to write Oh, thank you. Well, there are a couple of things that caused me to write it. Um, I've been doing a, a column for a UK magazine about different, different good guys throughout history, um, models of in inspiration, and I always find that when spiritual truths, when we see them incarnated in the lives of people who have lived those truths and who have struggled with the same things that we struggle with, that that is much more powerful um, for us than, than simply um, keeping things on, on the level of, of abstract ideas. And so in, um, in each of these, th this is not just objective historiography. I've tried to draw out spiritual principles that we can then apply in our lives, which I've, which I've at the end of each chapter, there are questions for discussion where I invite people to reflect critically on the historical material presented in that chapter. So that was a real, that, that was a real burden that I had to show, uh, to, to, to use historical models to help us with the questions that we grapple with uh, today. Um, I was also, I wanted to um, put the different figures in their larger historical context to, to see how uh, I chose people that were at pivotal times in history where there was a lot going on and I tried to, to use the book to give people a sense of that bigger picture in, in, in history. So, yeah, thank you for asking. You had a question? I did. Um, yesterday, I believe I heard Father Klopsis say that God hates suffering. Today, in talking about reframing, I think I heard you say that suffering comes from God. Is that a contradiction? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I'm, um, I'm, I struggle. I struggle with that as well, um, and I'm not sure that I, I have a, um, an, an answer for that. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot in, in the spiritual writings and in the scripture about um, how we can accept. Uh, suffering and even evil as somehow maybe not coming from the hand of God but God allowing it for our benefit but then then we also we also have um, have the teaching that um, that this is, uh, um, evil is not normative and God um, God hates it and I'm not sure if if I know how to to reconcile those those two aspects, I, I think it's it, it's a mystery, and I, I struggle with that that myself. But in in some sense, m both of those are, are are true. So I think we could do this for another hour, but maybe another question. I, I know you've been waiting. Yeah, um, just an observation. I remember taking hearing a retreat a while back on the Jesus Prayer and the priest and talking, and so he, he talked to us about like the the thoughts the way he's meaning he called them, you know, going on in our heads and how you know you get them down to prayer the heart. But it was interesting, he made a comment, he says, um, notice he says, when you have the attitude of gratitude in your brain, in your brain he says, it doesn't share any other space, you know, with any other thoughts. And I, thought, I found that very sort of what you were saying about, you know, you showed that bio sort of things and how I just kind of thought, and, and I, I, been practicing that, it's like I've noticed myself that you know when I have gratitude, it's just like everything else kind of moves out of the. So I just thought that was kind of an interesting observation, connecting it with what is yeah. when we practice gratitude, everything else kind of moves out of the way. Yeah, it kind of kind of uh, flushes toxic yeah. thinking out of the brain. Yeah. Thank you for that. Well, thank you very much.